So I'm just going to make a couple of announcements before we start uh, with the next session. Um, the first one is about the faculty meeting, which uh, will be over lunch. And uh, there will be a table uh, with the sign on it. Um, and the sign will say faculty meeting. So if you want to join the faculty meeting and your polls, uh, blah, blah, um, join this table. Uh, the second is uh, uh, hang your posters if you haven't already done so. And uh, there is a corridor all around, uh, but maybe we should cluster them on the same corner uh, or like anywhere you want. Hang your poster anywhere you want. The poster session will be tonight, but uh, you can leave it there and uh, uh, use it to discuss with people uh, 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 throughout the whole conference. And then um, um, I will let the chairman announce the speakers. I just want to say I'm really happy that uh, uh, Luca Pelitti joined us as a keynote because he's one of the uh, pioneers in this area in Italy. So. Welcome everyone to the second session of today. And so I'm honored uh, to welcome our first speaker of this session that is also the keynote speaker of this event, that is uh, Luca Pelitti. Uh, that will talk about uh, evolution uh, and uh, probability. So, hi. I don't think I'm going to tell you something that you don't already know, but just a way of looking at evolution from a point of view of uh, probability of uh, statistical physics, if you like. Uh, from uh, the point of view of statistical physics, if you like. So, as it were? Probably this is better. Okay, let's hope. Does it work now? Okay, so the, I start from this definition of uh, Fisher, say natural selection is a mechanism for generating exceeding high degree of improbability. And to, uh, no, usually what we see uh, evolution in some, in some sense of progress. Uh, we, have, we have seen uh, these kind of uh, figures everywhere in which you, we have seen the evolution of the human species in this way, uh, starting from ape, or the ape progressively, say, uh, stands up, and at the end becomes uh, an Anglo-Saxon, uh, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant specimen. Male, of course. Uh, absolutely. And of course, uh, the same thing, uh, the same story has been told for different species, like uh, the horse, or uh, Homer. And, and, but probably this is not really the way we should look at evolution, because it, it, it is a, as is, it, there were a target somehow, and evolution has only to find this target. But for, for example, we can look at what happens to the evolution of, of the eye. This is a, a scheme of, of human eye, but it's basically the, the scheme of all vertebrate eyes. And we can ask, how can such a complicated and sort of optimized device be evolved by the mechanism of uh, uh, variation and natural selection? In principle, just imagine that there are, I don't know, a, a thousand possible choices to be made in order to build up an eye, like the vertebrate eye and that there is an equal probability of going one way or the other. Then we have, say, of all possible paths, there is only one good path to build up the, the vertebrate eye, and the probability of, of finding the correct path by randomly moving on this uh, tree of choices is a 1 over 10 to the 300. So two, it's a very small probability, and it seems very strange that uh, this blind um, mechanism of uh, mutation and selection 
is able to find the correct path after all. Actually, it is not so strange. If we look at the octopus eye, there is this, uh, this is something that looks pretty much the same as the vertebrate eye, and in fact it works pretty much in the same way. But it does not derive from the vertebrate eye. And we can look at it, if we can see it if we look at, in the details on how it is made. And actually, it turns out that the engineer who engineered the octopus eye was probably a slightly better than the ones who engineered the vertebrate eye. In fact, if we see, if we look at the vertebrate eye, we find that the optic nerve gets into the globe and is above the retina, so it sort of screens, partially screens the retina. This is why we have a blind spot in our, in our eyes. And this is, uh, the blind spot correspond to the place in which the optic nerve enters through the retina into the, into the globe. And this does not happen in the, with the octopus eye. Sorry. This does not happen in the octopus eye. In, on the other hand, in the octopus eye, we have a sort of a ganglion in which there is a transfer of information from the retina to the optic nerve. Whereas in the case of the vertebrate eye, the uh, information is directly linked to the optic nerve. So you can, uh, you can think what is better from the one side or the other. But the bottom line of this reasoning is that the two eyes evolved through a completely different path to reach the same goal that is uh, eye with the conformation of the eye that is pretty similar. So there, is a, there were at least two different paths to, read, to reach the same destination. In fact, the idea of evolution is not so much looking at a uh, far target and then try to reach it in some way, but is rather looking what you have at your uh, availability, your disposal at a given moment, and find a way to improve the situation locally. So in, there is this famous um, quotation by Jacob that says, a natural selection does not work like an engineer, but like a tinkerer. He uses everything at his disposal to produce some kind of workable object. And just by improving on this um, at any given time, and with, a, with a given, uh, with a given uh, situation, is able to finally reach these very complex outcomes. The fact that this tinkering is really the hardcore of evolution can be shown by looking at small revealing imperfections that come out on the fact that Whatever was uh, evolved before cannot be unevolved easily. So we have this uh, very strange nerve called the recurrent laryngeal nerve, which starts from uh, the cerebellum, then goes around the heart, and then goes back to the larynx. So it makes quite a long detour around the aorta, which is in the chest, up to back to somewhere which is pretty near to where it started from. Now, this is not terrible for us, but uh, just imagine a giraffe has the same nerve. And the giraffe, has, so the, the nerve has to go all the way down the neck of the giraffe, going through the, below the heart, and then go back all the way to near, the, uh, to the, uh, near his, its head. So this is, this is how things look for a giraffe. <clears throat> so this, of course, if uh, evolution were engineered, such things would not happen. And why, why does it happen at all? Well, you can see it because there is, uh, say, we have inherited this basic scheme of our um, blood vessels, blood vessels and nervous system from our ancestors, fish ancestors. And in this case, 
uh, you can see on, uh, on the left. In this case, there is uh, no problem that you have that the, the, the uh, uh, ancestor was uh, this kind of nerve here, and, and then and the, um, this is the ancestor of the aorta, ventral aorta here. And then it just was uh, the, uh, the uh, following um, millions of years of evolution that uh, changed the, topo change the uh, distribution of these uh, vessels and uh, the nerves uh, to reach the situation that we have today that is described on the right. So in fact, the, the um, laryngeal nerve corresponds to this fourth branch of the vagus nerve that, I, oh, that is here. And, and turns it out of the sixth. So this here we see the sixth uh, branch of the uh, arterial arch. And this arterial arch is also in, active in the fetus and then stops, uh, is located in the chest. There is another aspect that is not, does not appear in this idea of evolution as, a, uh, say, uh, reaching a target, and that is a di diversification. Say, in, uh, mi in the Middle Ages, there was the idea that the, um, uh, say, the beings, I would say, called the uh, created things, were arranged in a uh, in an order of uh, like, uh, like a staircase. If you look at this, this is quite a famous image by Lul, who is, uh, uh, among others, the uh, uh, originator of a formal uh, notation of logic. And, and if you look and say, these are the different uh, beings in order of um, say nobility. If you start, you start here from lapis, which is a stone, and then there is, uh, there are different uh, animals, and then we arrive, uh, human are somewhere here, then there, there is the angel, and then at the top there is God. And all, everybody finds its place on this stair. So the only thing you can do is climb up or going down on the stair, but there is a path that it is well-defined and unique. But this is not how, uh, uh, how things really are. And I think that this is the way how the, this idea was broken by Darwin in one of his notebooks. The fact that the species are not uh, stabilized once and for all, but that they have this kind of a genealogy among themselves. They ramify and, and they look, and the distribution of species looks much more like um, a tree than uh, like a staircase. In fact, let's say uh, in the 1880s, Haeckel tried to put all the livings, as were known at the time, into, into one tree. And this is the way he puts it. You, you can see it, that you have a, a tree with three big branches. There are uh, plants, and then protists, and then animals where protists are <coughs> what we, and, and so all the livings would fit in one of these big branches, but then within each of these kingdoms, uh, there, were, there would be uh, several more differentiations. It is interesting, okay. Now we have more or less, again, uh, three branches. We, uh, we find that there are more or less uh, three branches of uh, living, but they, uh, um, the content of the branches is somehow changed in this way. Because if you look around, we have a bacteria. OK, this we all know. <clears throat> Since about 40 years, we know that uh, there, are, there is a, a big kingdom called the archaea that look like bacteria, but they are fundamentally different. And, they, um, and, and so they. Uh, and they are as diverse as, as the ordinary bacteria, and they, whose origin is about as old, almost as old as that of the bacteria themselves. 
and then we have the other branch of the eukaryotes, and in the eukaryotes we have that in fact animals and plants and fungi are a sort of a small branch at the end of, of a big branch that contains a, a great deal of other uh, differentiations that were not recognized at the time of Darwin or Haeckel. <clears throat> now, how can we understand this from a point of view of probability? Say, if we look at, uh, if you look forward, we find that, that each tree branch appears as the result of a high improbable process that is directed towards some goal. And so it seems uh, totally unlikely to, uh, to be successful. On the other hand, if you look from the root, there are so many viable choices that uh, you are sort of bound to eventually get somewhere. And just imagine that, say, uh, most of the living do not have many more um, um, complicated organs than a simple bacteria. And in fact, as they say, the, the, uh, as you keep thinking about it, you find that, that the hardest part was really at the beginning to get the first cell working. And then after, say, it was a piece of cake in some sense. Anyway, we also know that 99% at least of the species are dead. So it means that dead end exists and eventually you are bound, we are bound to find a dead end. But that some other way of surviving will be found. I don't know if you know the book by Stephen Jay Gould called Full House. So they say, well, most of the life we have is bacterial. And we are sort of an epiphenomenon that are tolerated by bacteria for some time. So let's go back. What are the mechanisms of evolution? We have, of course, a reproduction. Similar begets similar. We have selection. And the selection has been say, named uh, Survival of the Fittest by Spencer. This is sort of kind of a circular uh, definition. And I prefer the definition of Fisher that I mentioned before, say, a way of generating high degree of improbability. And there is a mutation. So the selection acts on the, po on the population. And the population remains always heterogeneous. We are very different, likely. And we, are, we have gone through selections because we were born, but we keep our, and we <laughs> cherish our differences. So in order to describe such a process, you have to describe it by probabilistic means, by probabilistic tools. Let's see how, say, how it works in a very simple model. So this is a right fissure model that is very simple. You have a heterogeneous population for the time being. We don't, look, we, uh, don't consider mutations. So the different colors here represent a different uh, types of a population of, it, of uh, living that uh, uh, reproduce by simple splitting, say, division, cell division. And the only thing that we have is that there is a carrying capacity. So the total population size remain constant. So the, uh, each column here corresponds to a generation. We imagine for, a, say, for a model's sake that the, uh, at each time unit you have a completely new generation. And the way it is done is just by choosing at random a certain number of uh, individuals from the old generation uh, reproduce uh, and uh, copy it and, and put in the holes of a new generation. What you have is just by fluctuations that some, uh, that some of the types just by chance uh, become more and more frequent in the population and eventually the whole population becomes homogeneous just by these uh, sampling fluctuations. And in fact, you can look at, uh, at the simulation I've done here, and it is quite characteristic. If you, uh, once in, uh, you can uh, get, a, um, say, the intuition pretty easily by looking at the fact that, that what you, what you uh, have here is that there are boundaries of, between the uh, frequency of a, of, um, in, 
of the subpopulation, say, the uh, size of the subpopulation of a given type, and these boundaries perform random walks. This kind of uh, diagrams you can see actually by, uh, for instance, marking uh, with fluorescent proteins different kinds of uh, bacteria and let the bacteria population expand on a petri dish. And you find in the case in which the different kinds of bacteria have no selective advantage, you find exactly this random walk that you can characterize quantitatively. And this is quite nice because, uh, okay, you, you see, for instance, in this case, we have a different site, subpopulations um, evolving in, uh, in uh, again, in a neutral case in the fact when there is no selective advantage for the different, uh, for the different kinds. And you have a different, uh, um, he, here we have um, a number of uh, different histories and sometimes you end up, you end up to fixation that the subpopulation you're looking at uh, covers the whole population. And sometimes, in, on the other hand, it goes to extinction. And it goes to extinction and we, as we see here, oh, here, and here, for instance. In the case in which one of the type is selected, you find that the behavior is quite different. You can recognize it on the fact that there is a sort of exponent, there is a range. It, from here, you find that there is still some sort of a diffusion of the boundary, adjusted by a random walk. But then after a while, it's, it gets in and it expands more or less exponentially until it covers the whole, uh, the whole um, the population. And so the, just by looking at the shape of this curve, you, can, you see that there is a selection is present and is effective. And it is interesting that it is not immediately effective. If you, if you there is a, this, this initial region in which in fact there is a still some sort of a random walk. It turns out that in order for selection to set in, the uh, number of individuals carrying the uh, trait that is selected must uh, be larger than a certain threshold that is called uh, the establishment threshold. So you need uh, the subpopulation to be established for the mechanism of selection to be um, stronger than the simple uh, random, uh, random sampling that happens in the, when the selection is not active. <clears throat> this is, let's see if it, if it works. So this is a way uh, in which a selection acts. As here we have, well, no. Sorry. Maybe you have to click on it. I have to click on it. No. Press on. So this is a kind of uh, a selection experiment. And actually, uh, this, uh, this simulation, I, <laughs> I used it almost 30 years ago here in ICTP when I gave the first lectures on evolution. <laughs> so you have a population. It's initially, uh, say, uh, located at the origin, but then the re we introduced that it is favored if it is at this point off, off the origin. And you find that just the mechanism of uh, differential reproduction uh, lets the population move to this, 
uh, to this other location and ah. close it This is the, <laughs> okay, this is uh, simply looking at the distribution of the x, uh, uh, of the x coordinate in uh, of this, of the experiment that I showed you before. And just say, until the um, time 150, there is, the uh, population is located near the origin, and then uh, there is uh, this, um, there is a switch to the uh, selection for the position at 0 0.5. And you find that, that there is, uh, the, the first effect is the fact that most of the population just disappears, that there is not able to reproduce. And then they start by uh, approaching the, uh, the optimal point. And again, you find that, that there is a, a kind of delay before the, the, uh, before the selection starts being filled. And of course, the selection is not perfect. Sometimes uh, you, you can have, here we have uh, several, uh, several experiments of the kind that I've shown you before, and looking at whether the uh, privileged variant of the population can, can establish itself. And what we see is that uh, there are a number of cases in which it is simply not able to go through beyond the uh, establishment threshold and goes to extinction just by some, by random sampling. The situation becomes more complicated if you will uh, consider the possibility that there are several mutations that, that could be under the uh, selection process at the same time. So in, in this case, we start with, a, say, a reference population, and then we have, for instance, a first mutation here and then a second independent mutation here, and so which are, so the first one is favored with respect to the wild type, the second one is favored with respect to the first one, and so they, they compete, and then we have beyond other mutations that play the same game, but within the descendants of the second mutation, and so on and so forth, so that if you look at what happens in time, you find that, that the different subpopulation grow and decay in, uh, in a way that it is, uh, well, in a way that it is possible to describe with probabilistic, probabilistic means in a quite, but in which you have to take into account the fact that, that uh, the uh, effective selection for a subpopulation depends on what all the other guys are doing at the same time. Uh, the fact that, that this is not uh, just uh, a model, but is uh, something that happens before, uh, that happens uh, really, can be, uh, uh, say, can be checked by experiments. For instance, here we have experiment, uh, repeated experiments on yeast in which w you have uh, the characteristic, uh, say, over, um, how to say, succession of uh, different subpopulations by mutation and selection over a certain number of generations, you find that, what you, that the behavior is, a, say, a pretty much reproducible. And the fact is that most of these, uh, the mutations that arrive in these experiments are, in fact, a comparatively e of easy access in the, uh, in the experimental situation that has been, that has been considered. So we have a situation in which quite often you have that some mutation become established, get selected, but before they can really go to fixation and dominate the whole population, there will be another mutation coming in that is slightly better and is able to establish and eventually to be selected for. So the point, this turns to the point, can we predict evolution? Well. Of course, the details of the evolution cannot be predicted. We have seen that, that even if we know that a given variant is, 
is uh, preferred in a given environment, then it may go to extinction simply because of the uh, sampling fluctuations. But however, a number of inferences can be made, and in some prediction can be, uh, can be done. And this example uh, is, uh, well, first uh, just example of uh, predictions. I think it's a famous example of prediction in evolution by Darwin and Wallace. Uh, so the, these are flowers in, in Madagascar. And what you see is these flowers have this long appendix that is called uh, nectary because it uh, contains the nectar and that uh, at the bottom of this quite long appendix. So this is almost a 30 centimeter long. And uh, Darwin says, well, there must be a moth which, with, a, with a tongue which is about 30 centimeter long. And uh, this tongue, it, this moth was found only in uh, 1903, so after Darwin's death. And just to hear you, this is a photo showing the moth throwing its, uh, its um, tongue into this flower, and this is, the, this is the tongue. So it is unrolled in front of the head of the moth. Because, so it has to unroll it like that when it has to fly, because otherwise, I mean, <laughs> we'll have a little bit of a problem. But so what you see is that Darwin predicted correctly uh, the existence of, uh, of uh, most species that just because of the fact that, that there was a flower with a given, uh, with a given structure. This is, so the body is 10 centimeter, and this is the, uh, the moth with its tongue. So the, what it says is that it, the details of the, of the evolution uh, cannot be predicted. What I mean is that it is very hard to know what happens at the genotypic, a genotypic level. But um, so it, it, there is a too large, the space is too large. There are too many variants possible. And this process is, in fact, only uh, partially constrained by selection because we know, for instance, that there are silent mutations that do not change the amino acid. And there are a number of uh, other uh, possibilities, for instance, of compensating mutations that, uh, on the other hand, so genotypic evolution is probably not predictable. But some, if you instead project onto a very much simple space that is a phenotypic space, then probably some kind of prediction can be done. Because the number of options is smaller, and you can distinguish different possibilities, and you can rank them in terms of likelihood of being able to survive or be preferred. So the idea, for instance, that you have a, a quantitative traits like, I don't know, um, size, for instance, typically. And you can have a different mechanism of selection, for instance, in which you have uh, stabilizing selection, if, you, if there is a preferred size, then the, the evolution of the population will make it narrowing around the preferred size. And if the optimal size changes with time due to the uh, properties of the environment, and then there is a, some sort of, uh, uh, you can predict in some way how the population will move and approach the new equilibrium. So here we have different patterns that you have for a quantitative trait. You can have, uh, depending on the subject, say the, the uh, sub mechanism that is, lies under uh, the evolution itself, you can have, say, a pattern of conservation. In neuter evolution, you reach, uh, uh, there is a, a measure of the diversity of a population in neutral evolution if a trait does not contribute to its selection that can be uh, uh, 
estimated in terms of the effective population size. That is a problematic quantity, but it can be, uh, say, sort of established in a, in a quite a reasonable way. And then you have different uh, patterns of, uh, say, if you have adaptation or conservation in, in terms of. Uh, so the evolution pattern allows you to identify what is the selection mode just by looking at, at the, well, just by. You have to have a good sampling of the population that you're looking at. Uh, the fact that the prediction of evolution is, uh, say, it's not just a dream, is in fact a technique in some cases, in turn uh, is manifested by the fact that, that there is now an established technique for predicting the evolution of influenza. And this is necessary to the fact, due to the fact that you have to prepare the vaccine a few months in advance so that there is a, a whole process. So this is, uh, this is a frequency of a different variants of influenza over the years, and you find that there is a substitution of a different variants over the years, uh, more or less over of every five, four to five years, you have a completely new variant that gets in and gets established. And you have to predict what it will be the dominant, um, dominant type in the next coming season of influenza. And this is done in, uh, by looking, this is done with this kind of uh, really quite complicated, but now, by now well established, um, system that is uh, done to provide enough information to produce uh, the vaccine of influenza for with uh, a few months in advance. Now, of course, <laughs> there is a little problem, and most of what I have uh, done was written in the early in, uh, 2019, and we know what happened in the late 2019. Uh, <laughs> And so I would say, uh, at this point, uh, there is something that can we say it is a prediction, or I would say it's a forecast. So this is by Quammen Spillover, and says, well, there has been a certain number of attempts by uh, viruses in animals to go over to our species. And some of them will su eventually succeed. Will the next big one come out of a rainforest or a market in southern China? So we say that this is, I wouldn't say it's a prediction, it's a forecast. The idea is that in some sense it, it was forecasted, but of course the details, we only found the details after it happened. And so this is a limitation that we have. And I think that this is, uh, we can conclude that nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution, but nothing in evolution makes sense except in the light of probability. The details of uh, genetic evolution are neither reproducible nor predictable, but the evolution of some quantity traits can be predicted, and some jumps in the evolutionary process can be forecasted, but the details are, in fact, not predictable. And I think with this, I can thank you for it. Thank you very much. And uh, questions? Yeah, do you need the microphone? Yeah, okay. In Yeah, in fact, this is, say, there, there is also a whole branch in which you're looking at how, how these uh, established. For instance, we had the model with Manzo in which there was a sort of, uh, uh, say, a number of islands. And what you had is that the, uh, the system reached the point in which 
there was a sort of a traveling wave of the islands due to the fact that the, um, uh, say, uh, no, uh, no species, was, no, no variant was optimal. It was a, some sort of uh, a rock scissor uh, paper, um, paper game, but was uh, geographically distributed. And this, in, in some sense, you, you can find it also in, uh, in nature, that there are, there are some sort of, actually, influenza itself is a traveling wave in, uh, in Southeast Asia. So it can survive because it does not establish in one point, but it's traveling all around uh, with the seasons. So this is a, certainly one, one of the cases in which spatial is, spatial is important. Sure, sure, yeah, for the case of influenza, for instance, you have a problem that there is a spillover from southern, southern to northern, which uh, makes uh, the season earlier, and uh, this is a big problem, in fact, for the vaccine, yeah. Well, it was very nice uh, to hear this. I, I, I uh, of course, uh, greatly admire this whole field that you really, uh, invented uh, sort of mathematizing uh, Darwin. Uh, I wonder what people are thinking, and you in particular are thinking about the things that are outside that very particular Darwinian tree of life thing, uh, namely horizontal gene transfer. We think that that's what happened, say, before the last common ancestor, that's a Carl Woese idea. And then of course, in modern times, there's a thing called sex, sex <laughs> um, <laughs> which uh, I think uh, also is not sort of at the microscopic level described by the, the dynamics you have. Is that something everyone could just sort of coarse grain out? Or are there uh, other more complicated things that can happen? Well, uh, I think that it really depends on uh, which level you're looking at. So for the sex itself, I think that this is quite well established also from a point of view of, uh, say, uh, evolutionary impact and the, uh, and the way in which variants can get established. So no, there are plenty of uh, m even, math m say, hard mathematical treatment of that. At the level of evolution, I think that this is a, a horizontal scene, uh, traffic is very important for for instance, uh, the, uh, the level, of course, of uh, uh, microbial communities, and also for um, protists, even for protists, for protists have this very uh, often have this very complicated sex uh, distribution, in which it is very important. Say so that they have some. Some of them have six, 60 different sexes, and in this case, it also from the point of view of selection, is very important that they keep a certain amount of variety via mechanism of horizontal gene transfer. But myself, I'm say, not terribly familiar with that. Uh, hi. Uh, so most of your examples are very nice, you know, are sort of macroevolution ones. Yeah. But there's, there's a somehow in many people's work on, let's say, evolution of circuits or particular protein complexes or machines, there's an implicit assumption that you can forget all about this and assume the system has somehow evolutionarily wise reached some optimal performance. Do you believe that that's actually true <laughs> uh, for you know, some molecular machines? Or in other words, the assumption is there's enough variation, enough time to sample everything and to find something which you can find separately by just optimizing what's possible, what's best, what's most fit. As, and now that clearly doesn't work in the macroscopic world as you pointed out, does it work at the microscopic world? Does it, there's some transition that you think occurs? I'm curious your opinion about that. It's a very, this is a very good question. In fact, to say, I believe that if you look, it's quite strange because, for instance, look at uh, um, the ribosome. The ribosome has, in some sense, uh, uh, frozen, uh, frozen structure. It's a unique structure because it combines the proteins and the nucleic acid in the same. And so, it, uh, I, on the other hand, it must be optimal in some sense, it, at least within the uh, within the possibilities that uh, life allows it to, to vary. 
because uh, it is uh, so fundamental that if it had, uh, say, a basic defect, it would, would not work. Um, so my impression is that at the very deep level, uh, you can probably not touch too much, say, what is very fundamental. Uh, on the higher level, well, we know that there are some defects in our metabolism that are inherited and then some show off as uh, the random, uh, random uh, illness, random disease that uh, would be wiped out in a few generations if there were not medicine. So why not? I mean, uh, that means that even in the nature, there are some a number of uh, not suboptimal um, molecular uh, mechanisms that are kept uh, because they are, the, uh, the selection coefficient is not so strong. I don't know. I, I think that it depends on which level you're looking at. When, if it is on very fundamental under very strong selection, probably it is optimal. But otherwise, why not? Uh, so, Luca, so uh, thanks for the very nice talk, uh, lecture, and uh, so I was wondering, uh, uh, so you started with this I, uh, this paradox, uh, and say and the idea that evolution goes by rare events. Uh, and, um, but then, uh, um, so I'm puzzled because, uh, say, then you discussed a lot about, say, uh, neutral evolution and uh, uh, Fisher Wright model, and so in what sense can we think of uh, this evolutionary process as a large deviation event, like uh, uh, thinking of, uh, say, the, the discovery of the eye as a, say, as a large deviation event where instead of the fit, average fitness uh, of your population, you look at uh, an atypical high fitness. Well, I think that even the simulation that I've done is shows you, if you look at the distribution of the population and the point in which selection acts, which is outside of the, uh, of the population, the way, reason why the population is able to find at this optimal point is the fact that there are some outliers there. Some outliers there find, ha ha, there is a region in which uh, the fitness improves, and they start reproducing there. So in this sense, it is really the tail of the distribution that allows the whole population to move to the new optimum. And it is amplified by the mechanism of uh, differential reproduction. So I, in, in a sense, I agree. That is, if I understood correctly what you told me. Hello. I have a question about your, your tree of life. So uh, I know it was uh, in part you know, due to a, a colleague of ours from the University of Illinois, uh, Carl Vos, and he did it by comparing the ribosomal RNA. Yeah. Uh, he, he could only do the 16 at that time, and, and I know we repeated it later. And it's, for the ribosome, it did hold up, but uh, the difficulties he had in having that tree and the archaeas accepted was only because some European colleagues really looked into the membranes, uh, the differences. So based on that, have you ever thought of perhaps a better way of classifying organisms that ju uses just not the ribosome, um, but some other feature of the cell? Yeah, actually, the fact that the membrane uh, lipids are different in the archaea than in the uh, ordinary bacteria is, I think, is the really the uh, culprit. Let's put it this way. And also, there is a debate whether the eukaryotes sort of branched off the archaea or not. And I'm say this is really outside of my uh, of my competence. I'm sort of sympathetic with this uh, with this description that I that I brought uh, that is uh, sort of common description. And I think that the, the um, this difference of the of the lipids is really the very fundamental because it's very hard to imagine how you can have say overcome of uh, an established 
um, machinery to produce some kind of lipids, and then suddenly you produce a different one. I, I don't know. I have no solution to this problem. <clears throat> Hi, Luca. Thank you for, for the lecture. Um, I would like to, if you can comment about the, the fitness, the concept of fitness. I mean, in these uh, models, uh, we typically use uh, fitness as a parameters uh, and uh, that can uh, act on the probability success of the species. But actually, um, uh, it's, I mean, uh, there are more and more evidences uh, that, of course, uh, this is a very high dimensional, how to say, time dependent uh, uh, parameters uh, that maybe depends on the also interaction, so the ecological dynamics. So, uh, in the last years, uh, there have been uh, some uh, interesting developments. I mean, can you comment about this? I think it's an interesting point. I think that this is a fundamental point. In fact, that this is something that we put under the rug when we make this kind of... Uh, that means that you cannot uh, really separate evolution itself from, uh, from the uh, ecology, from the community, so that uh, the correct setting is eco-evolution. But we are still... I think that we are still starting uh, with a great deal of difficulties to have some sort of coherent description of eco-evolution as a whole adapting system. Um, so I agree with that. Fitness itself is very nice when you write simple models, but of course the actual success of... Uh, it's hard to measure, in fact, for instance. And we find some way of um, possibilities of measuring, for instance, in microbial, uh, microbial communities, but it's, uh, it's multidimensional. It has uh, several uh, components, and I agree with that. But uh, basically, the fact is that uh, we have to move from uh, this uh, species-focused uh, uh, description of evolution to eco-evolution, uh, the evolution of the whole community. So just uh, something maybe you didn't press by choice cover is um, the evolution of complexity. So there are some people that argue that uh, there is a neutral bias towards constructing more complex systems. Like if you have sticky proteins, you will make complexes and then higher order complexes. Uh, what's your take on the evolution of complexity? Well, say the uh, Stephen Jay Gould answer is say, well, you cannot be much simpler than a simple cell, but on, say the space on the other side is infinite. So eventually you will go as complex as you wish. So this is a sort of, uh, I think, I think it, it re it's really the answer. Uh, it makes sense. Um, there is no intrinsic advantage in being uh, more complex, but it just it's over there. I mean, why not? Uh, other questions? Okay, if that's it, we can thank you very much. I invite Emma Bingham, who uh, will talk about the emergent structure and fluid flow in early multicellular evolution. Uh, hi, my name is Emma Bingham. Uh, I'm a PhD student in the Yunker and Radcliffe labs at Georgia Tech. Um, and I'm just going to tell you a little bit about the project I'm currently working on. Um, so, um, first of all, someone just mentioned complex life. So, multicellularity, the evolution of multicellular organisms was transformative for life on Earth um, and made possible, you know, these landscapes. Um, diverse landscapes that we see, and as well as, of course, you know, these types of charismatic large organisms, for example, and lots of other things. Um, but why become multicellular in the first place? Well, um, one thing is having a large size can provide a lot of benefits. So, for example, uh, 
you might avoid predators more easily, uh, resist stress, sediment faster, and a number of other examples that you could think of. Uh, however, uh, large size can often come with uh, a biophysical cost, which is um, basically, uh, if you're a big group of cells, um, the nutrients are all outside and you need to be able to get them inside to feed all the cells. And so you run into this thing um, people call diffusion limitation, where only the outside cells may be getting nutrients, and um, this is gonna come with a sort of, usually some sort of growth cost or some type of cost for the organism um, that it has to deal with somehow. So like in this example, um, you can see the organism, the, this is a colony of bacteria and the outside cells only are getting the nutrients and it kind of costs to compensate by doing this um, growth rate oscillation. Um, so the problem is how, how can you feed all your cells so your growth won't be constrained so you could evolve to become larger and grow large. So we have a model system for studying evolution of large size um, and it's called snowflake yeast and um, it's this, it's an SCR of ECI where um, the mother, the daughter cells stay attached to the mothers when they bud to form these branching clusters. Um, and we evolved this for actually more than a thousand days in the lab now um, for large size by selecting it for large size. And uh, it creates these um, clusters of cells that are now on millimeter scale sizes, whereas they started at, at micron, tens of micron scale. Um, and so you would think that these clusters are um, going to experience this kind of diffusion limit, but we see that, first of all, they, they, they don't seem to have a growth limitation. They um, grow exponentially to this millimeter size, which is past the, the usual amount of diffusion limitation that we see in organisms. And um, second, we can do an experiment with um, this kind of uh, fluorescent tagged glucose molecule, and we could see that it um, actually penetrates through the whole cluster. So we were wondering how, how could these clusters be able to um, to basically receive nutrients throughout the cluster. So this led us to thinking about um, how, so, okay, basically what, what we grow the clusters, we grow them in this shaking incubator and they are tossed around and the fluid is moved around a lot. So we're, we're thinking um, they're basically taking advantage of, of flows somehow and um, how are they doing that? So we started thinking about the internal structure of the clusters. Um, they, when the clusters evolve to become large, they develop these elongated cells um, and they start to form these, um, instead of just the mother-daughter connections, they start to form these, this type of entangled structure as well where the branches are all entangling together with each other. So um, basically uh, this creates two kind of characteristics that we're thinking about. Um, so first is that entangled, this entangled structure, it makes them tougher, they can, withstand flows without falling apart. Um, and also, uh, they, they, we think they, they seem to have some sort of permeability also to allow fluid through. They don't have an extracellular matrix, for example, like biofilms. Um, so kind of what, what we're thinking about with this project is, um, like, are, are these in kind of a sweet spot to do this? Or can we create some kind of phase diagram to uh, show like what, what sort of organisms might be able to do this and, and overcome diffusion limits in this, in this way. Um, so that's kind of the pitch for my project. Thanks for listening. Um, come talk to me at the conference and you can email me as well. So thank you. Quick question. Can you play with them mechanically to change the structure? Like if you compress them do they align differently? Or? Um, so we, ha we haven't tried that. So the, the only mechanical thing that has been tried with them is like squishing them to see, um, you know, how tough they are. Um, so we haven't tried that exactly. It could be interesting though. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. We invite, uh, uh, we can take the speaker again. <laughs> and we invite uh, uh, Min Soo Kim. Well, I would like to thank the organizer for this wonderful um, conference. So one of the primary examples that we see 
in, in the hospital for the, the evolution is the emergence of antibiotic resistance. Right? And we can easily rationalize why this is important. So, you know, if it's antibiotic susceptible, then we can treat them. Right? But if it's resistant, the treatment fails. Okay? But if you actually look at the data, the picture is more complicated. So if you talk to a doctor and it says it's never this simple, it's actually they follow these 9060 rules. Okay? So for susceptible strain, okay, the treat oh the treatment works in 90% of cases. Okay? And they categorize a strain to be resistant if treatment works less than 60%. So there's still high chance of treatment success even if the strain is um, categorized as a, as a resistant. Okay. So what this shows is that this binary categorization is not, doesn't have that good of predictive power. Okay. And so it's insufficient. And I'll, I want to tell you one story that we've been dealing with that actually came from the, the instance that took place at Amory Hospital. And it shed some light on the issue of this binary categorization. Okay, so a patient came with a nasty infection. And um, so doctor then wanted to see whether that bug was susceptible or resistant to antibody, right? And they, now how do they do that in the clinical lab? So they use a, um, okay, they use this E-stream, so it's E-test. So what does it do? So this E-test, there is a increasing concentration of antibiotics, okay? And in this play, they spread the bug and put this E-strip and then incubate it. And you see this, this zone of clearance, right? Within this zone, bacteria die, okay? And outside of the zone that they grow because antibiotic concentration is less, okay? Because it, uh, it, it, it travels through diffusion, okay? So then you look at the size of this, this zone, okay? and if it's antibiotic resistant, then you'll get smaller size, right? So you don't have to really look, quantify, just by looking at the zone, doctor can easily screen, oh, this is susceptible, this is resistant, okay? So this doctor performed this assay and found that this bug that he was dealing with was resistant to all the commercially, commercially available antibiotics. Okay? And then what do they do? Then they follow this procedure that there is this last resort antibody okay, where they typically put it in a the shelf, they don't use it. Okay? For the fear that, that um, the bacteria might develop resistance. And one of those antibiotics is a cholestin. And the doctor went ahead and performed this assay and he, and he thought that he observed this. Okay? He went ahead and treated the patient and the treatment failed. And unfortunately, the patient died. Okay? So this was shocking because cholestin has been working, it has been a reliable source of a, as, as a last region antibody. Okay? There was an institutional review. Okay? And it turned out that doctor actually saw, it turned out that this was what was happening. Okay? And unfortunately, doctor missed this. Okay? And if you see this clearance zone to them, Okay, it's the same size as this susceptible strain, right? So they said, oh, this is susceptible. And then later they found that there is this uh, dots in the middle. Okay? And they, some, at the first side, they thought that it was uh, contamination, so they repeated the assay again. They saw exactly the same behavior. Okay? And then we call this heteroresistance. And what are these guys? If you quantify that, so if you count the, the size of this population, population size, the, um, the fraction of this resistance of population as you increase antibody concentration, and typically it goes, it's dropped to zero, but there's this long plateau that does not go away. And these are the guys that form the colonies in the middle of that, that clearance zone, okay? And these are different from persisters because they form colonies, right? Persisters are the guys that do not grow, and as a result, tolerate antibody. Okay? But as soon as persistors wake up, they grow, their MIC or their susceptibility the same, is the same as a susceptible cells, right? So they get cleared. So in this case, they grow. So their population size actually increase in the presence of antibodies, right? So this is a resistance strain. Okay? So the 
natural question that emerges is, is that, oh, <laughs> we're working three questions, not two questions. So, <laughs> so how frequently is a person heterogeneous? Okay? Now, there's absolutely no data. The reason is that we are, doctor was never asked to look at these clearance zones. Okay? And also, if you look at bio, biogram, there is only like two marks. Is it susceptible or is it resistant? Okay? There's no other mark to check is that resistant. Okay? So now what we're doing is that we're going through a clinical isolate and see how frequent this heterogeneous has been happening. Okay? And then the second question is that how to detect heterogeneous. Okay? So the example I gave you was rather exceptional because um, we were able to see dots, but if the frequency of that or, or the the, um, the fraction of the cell population is small, you actually don't see it, so you miss it. Okay? So then what are the ways to efficiently characterize heterogeneous? So that's another important question. And the lastly, the what is the mechanism? Okay? So um, our collaborator at Uppsala University, Dan Anderson, show, shown that gene amplification okay, can be one mechanism. And you can see it by just sequencing it. Okay? Now, when the example I showed you, we did the sequencing and there's no gen genetic changes. There's no gene amplification. So now we believe it's a phenotypic and now we've been working through this problem for several years. So, that I, so we have some answers to you know, what gives you this phenotypic diversification that gives rise to this subpopulation. Okay? So the Muching and Tats are the two major drivers of this research. And this is my lab and a funding source. Super quick question, maybe we can postpone it over lunch. It's a super. The comment is that in, in the cancer world, it's quite common to have persisters that then go back to cycling behavior. Yeah. So the idea that you can have a phenotypic persister, which then recovers the ability to divide even in the presence of drug is well established. This is the first time I'm really seeing it in a bacterial antibiotic. Yeah, yeah. So the example I gave you is actually the first time that, that showed that heteroresistance caused a treatment failure. So that kind of awoke, awoke, we woke it up from realizing the importance of this plan now. Thanks again to the speaker. And then um, we invite Eduardo Luna who will talk about the uh, non-equilibrium dynamics of cancer cell invasion uh, modeled by the Dean Kawasaki equation. Hi all, I'm, I'm Eduardo Luna. Uh, I'm a PhD student in Dave Theormalize group at UT Austin. Uh, even though the title of my talk says cellular dynamics, this is really a, um, a prescription to studying um, many body systems out of equilibrium. And so, um, say you have a, a general system of uh, N, N Brownian couple uh, interacting particles. Um, for overdamped dynamics, so you can iner ignore inertial terms. Um, this paper by David S. Dean introduces a way to studying the uh, fluctuations of the density profile of the system. And what's interesting in this equation is that um, if you take a free field with no interactions um, and n goes to infinity, uh, you can actually show that this uh, noise term um, ends up going to zero, and yeah, you're, you're left with a diffusion equation. Um, and so for studying uh, the non-free field case where there are interactions, um, a dynamic renormalization scheme is used um, to scale the variables and also a method known as stochastic quantization originally proposed in quantum field theory, uh, which introduces a new fictitious time variable, and it turns the original stochastic PDE into this new Langevin equation uh, in which you can construct an action um, 
uh, which, which does have a uh, equilibrium distribution and um, the fluctuation dissipation theorem is satisfied in this new um, Langevin equation. And so to get the Green's function of this system, um, this is a Dyson equation and which uh, you, you need to calculate the self-energy. And, and this is really the, the, the most technical uh, my, this, this presentation gets. And uh, from this perturbative analysis, you can get scaling exponents for the MSD of the particles. And you can actually relate the correlation functions of the field fluctuation. So say you look at the density, density, time correlation and time you can show that the scaling satisfies this power law and the dynamic exponent z uh, is related between the MSD and the correlation function in this way. And for those of you that might not know what a self-energy is, um, it's basically like uh, where two different uh, wave vectors um, interact and couple to each other. So in this case, it would be like a cubic interaction with wave vector k coupling with k1 and k minus k1. And so ba back to biology. Um, in this experimental study, uh, it, it's shown that for non-cancerous endothelial cells, uh, they undergo super diffusion, super diffusion motion and um, these waiting times are just uh, defined as starting the experiment, um, waiting zero hours, and then calculating the MST profile. So after 20 hours, um, if you start calculating the MST exponents, uh, it would be one point in the regime of 1.5. And so my numerical studies of the Dean Kawasaki equation um, because of the time constraints, I, I leave out the coupling to the cancer field. So in, in this case, I only have one solution. So just the non-cancerous endothelial cells uh, and the, their field equation. And um, so initially, the fluctuations are more or less uniform. And after, after you time evolve, um, these cluster effects are observed. Um, and here, here are some movies that I'll play and continue talking. So the, the evolution of the, the endothelial cell system uh, would look something like that. So uh, after a while, these uh, clustering, kind of, kind of reminiscent of reaction diffusion systems. And now, now if you look at the distribution of the number of particles per cell, um, cell in this case would be like one of these grid cells looks something like this. Uh, after some time to this distribution also goes to some steady state profile. So the, the time correlation in this case um, has an exponent of minus two. And if you do the, the arithmetic to get the So you see the exponent here is defined in this way, and the exponent for the MSD is two over Z. If you calculate Z in this case, it's about 1.33, and uh, that leads to uh, an MSD of um, about 1.5, um, which uh, is, it agrees well with the experimental results. I'd like to thank um, uh, my group, and if you have any questions um, about the uh, theory or the, uh, other numerical results of mine, uh, feel free to uh, find and ask me or uh, email me, which is just my, my full name at utexas.edu. Thank you. For the, to the speaker, and if there are no questions, maybe we can postpone them to lunch. And we invite the last speaker of the session, that is uh, Christopher Joel Russo. 
and he will talk about uh, slow dynamical modes, enhanced environmental and multinomial robustness. All right, hello, thank you so much. Um, my name is Chris Russo. I'm a PhD student at University of Chicago um, in the Biophysics PhD program, and um, uh, I'm, in, I'm advised by Arvind Murgan. And so Ricardo, another student yesterday from the group, talked about uh, evolution of evolvability. Today I'm gonna talk about sort of a related idea. We're um, very interested in sort of evolution of robustness um, and its relationship to slow dynamical modes. Um, so, one of the defining features of all living systems, from single cell organisms to uh, complex vertebrates, is um, that they, are, they have uh, mechanisms that allow them to respond to environmental changes. Temperature shocks, changes in pH, osmotic stress, changes to nutrient environment. Um, this is like one of the defining features of living things. But not only that is sort of, you know, over the past decades of molecular biology, as we've sort of investigated and, and, and elucidated some of the mechanisms by which biological systems respond to stresses, um, one of the patterns that sort of we've, people have started to notice is there's often sort of a characteristic network topology to these mechanisms of robustness, where sort of high-dimensional information about the cellular state is sort of compressed down into some low variable um, for example, the concentration of, of some molecular species in the cell, um, which is in turn orchestrating sort of a complex response um, to the perturbation. And, and these can respond to you know, very diverse perturbations. Um, uh, and so we, we call these sort of low dimensional controllers. Even if the dimensionality of the, of the input is very high, um, there's often sort of a low dimensional internal variable that's or orchestrating the response to stress. And the, the molecular details don't really matter so much, but these are just sort of two illustrative examples um, cyclic AMP, um, where sort of high dimensional uh, inputs about sort of cell state are, are being integrated into the concentration of cyclic AMP, which is in turn orchestrating transcriptional regulation, protein uh, activation inhibition, and then PPGPP in, in prokaryotes, where you know temp at temperature stress, uncharged tRNA are sort of um, modulating PPGPP, which is in turn regulating transcription, translation, metabolic processes. And so the question we're trying to address in this project is, you know, how do these simple controllers work? How, how, is, how is a controller where really there's a sort of single variable at the heart of it, how is it able to respond to diverse environmental perturbations? Um, and sort of, um, we had this idea that maybe slow, mo slow dynamical modes have something to do with this. And sort of just to, to recap what this is, is, you know, if you have a dynamical system, um, there may be sort of a, that has a fixed point um, that it relaxes to, there may be sort of a separation of time scales and that um, maybe, maybe the system will very quickly relax to a, a single mode and, or some small number of modes and then uh, relax slowly along that mode to the fixed point. Um, a slow mode is also a soft mode in that, you know, uh, arbitrary perturbations to the system are gonna be sort of disproportionately in the direction of that, of that mode. Um, and sort of to investigate the, this, maybe this, is, this plays a part in, um, in how these simple controllers work. Um, we have some analytic theory as well, but today I'm just gonna sort of present our, our numerical results. Um, so we sort of construct a simple model of a gene regulatory network um, where you have these, um, uh, uh, you know, many different genes which are regulating each other with Michaelis-Menten kinetics. Um, and there's going to be sort of a, uh, like a, a wild type fixed point um, and we also impose that it has a controller of the sort that we saw earlier where, you know, sort of high dimensional sensing inputs are being compressed and, and are, are, are being projected down onto these some number of internal controller nodes, which is then sort of uh, like, it, which is then controlling a uh, restorative response to the system. Um, and we, uh, and so we say the system is fit if, like we're defining fitness of the system as if the, uh, if this controller is able to uh, sort of restore, or how well the controller is able to restore uh, the system back towards the wild type fixed point uh, in the face of, of you know, diverse environmental uh, perturbations, which we represent here. Um, and, you know, and we average over many diverse environmental perturbations that are sort of pushing different nodes, um, uh, in the, meaning that we, won't, we sort of, we say the system is fit if it is robust to many different kinds of perturbations. And so, um, 
what we find is if we do a sort of an evolution simulation with, uh, Markov, with sort of Markov chain Monte Carlo, and what we find is if the num number of those internal controller nodes is very low, in this case it's just one, uh, as you sort of select for fitness, as we did find earlier, what you find is the mode gap uh, increases dramatically, that, that you get a very big uh, difference in the time scale between the first and second mode, versus if you have a very high complexity controller with as many internal nodes as the system itself, you, you, don't, see the, um, you don't see a mode gap emerge. Um, and so we, we posit that this might be a mechanism by which these sort of low, these, um, uh, these low complexity controllers may work in biological systems and that they sort of listen to and restore the system along a slow mode um, where the effects of sort of, of environmental challenges are being sort of channeled. Um, so this model makes a couple of testable predictions um, which, we, which we sort of investigate with some data sets. Um, so one of, the one of the predictions is that uh, slow modes, it, it, you know, if, if you have this sort of slow mode mediated robustness, um, you get this sort of duality of environmental robustness and mutational robustness. That even, even if you select just for environmental robustness, if there is a slow mode, mutational perturbations are also likely going to uh, push the system along that slow mode. And in this way, the, the, these mechanisms that, that confer robustness to environmental stresses will also kind of for free give you mutational robustness. And so there's this long-standing uh, discussion of um, sort of HSP90, as, which is this heat shock protein, as a sort of mutational buffer or mutational capacitor. Um, we also sort of investigated this with a data set um, from the, the Boone group at um, University of Toronto, where there's actually two experiments where they have these sort of high throughput fitness assays. One is sort of these um, pairwise all, all, all possible sort of non-essential pairwise knockouts, and then they did a sort of high throughput fitness assay. And then another experiment they did is sort of um, all uh, all po fitness assay on all possible non-essential gene knockouts across a bunch of different environmental perturbations in yeast. And so you can use this basically to identify genes that are you know, buffering the effects of, of many other mutations um, or genes that are buffering the effects of many different environmental conditions. And what you find is that this histogram shows um, genes that um, buffer many environmental conditions also tend to buffer uh, a large number of mutations. Um, another, now this is a very counterintuitive prediction, but another testable prediction that this makes is that knocking out these controllers that are listening to and restoring systems along <coughs> slow modes will actually um, reduce the dimensionality of the effect of perturbations. This is a little counterintuitive, but basically, um, if you have a slow mode and if the controller is restoring the system along the slow mode, that, that mode is kind of canceled out by the controller, and so um, uh, you may get sort of higher dimensional effects of perturbations that are sort of not controlled by the, the controller. But if the controller is knocked out, um, then, um, uh, then, in, then challenges will tend to push the system along to slow mode, and so you'll get a low, di low dimensional effect of perturbations. Um, and so we investigated this with the data set from our collaborators in the um, uh, David Pincus group at University of Chicago, um, where they have a uh, sort of, they, they did a sort of um, a tr a transcriptomics on um, these sort of kinase knockdown yeasts uh, across many different environmental perturbations. And what we find is if you knock out TPK123, which is a kinase that mediates the cyclic AMP system that I, I presented earlier, um, what you find is that the, if you do PC, this sort of simple preliminary analysis with PCA, what you find is that the effective dimensionality of, uh, of the effect of various perturbations is lower. Um, you need fewer principal components to explain the effect of, um, of the various different um, perturbations. You can also see this with a Tisney plot where you can see across, um, you know, these different environmental perturbations tend to cluster with each other and tend to have idiosyncratic responses, or sorry, tend to have different effects from each other, except for the TPK123 knockouts. In, in this case, all of the mutations, or all the environmental conditions had a sort of stereotyped effect and clustered together. Um, so it, to summarize, uh, you know, simple com controllers are, these low dimensional controllers are common in biological systems. Um, and they allow organisms to be robust in the face of environmental challenges. Um, also, these slow mode, and, and so we posit that slow modes uh, may explain how these simple controllers are so effective. Um, you know, in the, in the presence of a simple controller, selection for robustness actually leads to the evolution of these slow modes. Um, and uh, in, in, in our sort of 
this slow mode mediated robustness gives us some testable predictions, which we explore with data. Again, this sort of duality between environmental and mutational robustness and sort of the fact that, that knocking out the controller reduces the dimensionality of the effect of environmental stresses, which we sort of explore with data. Um, so I'd like to acknowledge uh, Arvin, my, my advisor on this project, also uh, currently Professor Kabir Hussein, who is a postdoc in the group who, who has helped me a lot with this, and then our collaborator, David Pincus. Um, and then I'm co-advised by Arvind and, and Sarah Kobe at U Chicago, so I'd like to acknowledge the rest of those groups. Time for questions. Yep. Thanks for the great talk. I was wondering if you're, if the control is low dimensional, then the parameter space uh, also has a large gap in its eigenvalues uh, around the point. And have you looked? Uh, at yeah. So the way maybe I should have clarified. So. Um, uh, yes. So what we do is if you we, if you start with a low dimensional controller and you. Uh, and you evolve this, and you sort of evolve this this uh, gene regulatory network with the controller. What you find is that the the mo gap of that, like, or about the fixed point of that network, increases as you sort of select for robustness. Eigenvalue spectrum gap is correlated with the time scale. Uh, uh, it, it, comes, it comes from the it, it comes from the, the, the like the, like these KK terms of the of the gene regulatory network. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, I don't want to... questions? Or, or, yeah, more. Okay. I guess we can. So, uh, your first headquarters is evolutionary and mutational robustness and environmental robustness. Do you have a control that without it, you wouldn't have this effect? Because it seems like, like an obvious thing that many classes of models, even without the controller, will have that problem. We'll have a slow mode. Or what, yeah, yeah, without a slow mode, you still may have a correlation Yeah, sure. I, yeah, I'm not. Um, uh, yeah, I guess our argument is if there isn't if there isn't a slow mode, then um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, you, you could you could posit other models, but our, I guess our argument would be that if if there isn't a slow mode, like the the effect of an environmental versus a mutational perturbation could be orthogonal to each other, and you wouldn't necessarily get that the robustness mechanism uh, works for both. Any more questions? Okay, then we can thank the speaker again.